Our next talk is on protected areas, the ranger's role in them. And to provide this talk is Harvey Locke. He's a conservationist, author, and photographer. He's a founder of Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative and the founder of Nature Needs Half Movement. And I will say that Harvey has a couple of books that are for sale at the Rocky Mountain Conservancy out here, and he will be doing a book signing in the break right after uh, uh, this session here. So please help me welcome Harvey Locke. Okay, how do we get on to the next image here? Or escape, and then you try to find mine. So hello, everybody. I would, while I'm waiting for this to, to appear, and I hope we have our techie to help my show appear. Um, maybe not. Um, here it is. I think we found it. My wife is coming to the rescue, as always. Listen, if it's not for her, I wouldn't even make it here. So, it's Okay, so I think we're... All right, how's that? Okay. Buenos dias, todo el mundo. Uh, voy a dar mi charla en inglés. Uh, espero que no uh, hablará des, uh, des, uh, demasiado rápido. And thank you all very much for having me. I would like to um, share a little story. How many of you here were last night when I was the straight man for Shelton? <laughs> so I want to tell you a story about that. Um, this picture is taken in the edge of Banff National Park and Mount Assiniboine Provincial Park where uh, we live, a World Heritage Site complex. And last night I was asked, how would you feel if your family was from a place and these guys from the government came around and made a park? Well, actually, that's exactly what happened to my family. Um, at my back here is a place called Brewster Creek, which is named after my great-great-grandfather. And that's in Banff National Park. And my family are big, fat supporters of national parks, just so you all know. <laughs> and that's the world's third oldest national park. It was started in 1885. So it's, uh, it's interesting, but one can be a local person and love national parks. So you're looking at one. And I want to spend a second and talk about where home is for all of us. Uh, this is our home. And the only question that matters in the 21st century is how we're going to relate to our home. And I want to say this, I'm going to unabashedly flatter your, my audience, no one in the world is doing more important work than this room full of people who are looking after that. And that's really what a park or a wilderness area or protected area is about. It's about our relationship with our planet, our home the only one we have. And when you hear somebody question whether your work is worthwhile, you say, yes, it is because I am looking after the interest of all humanity and all other life forms on earth. There is no nobler thing to do with your life than what you're doing. And I wanna talk about the origin of our parks and where they should go. And I'm going to invite you to dream along with me. El sueño del mundo, le rêve de la terre. Where are we going with this world of ours and our role in it? And I want to talk about where the beginnings of parks come from. Uh, I'm going to speak a lot more slowly than that little video Mike showed that was going really, really fast, but it has a lot of what I'm going to talk about in it. Um, this image is a really powerful one. This one is called American Progress. If you're from a commonwealth country like me, you'd say progress, but it's the same thing. Um, and this is about liberty bringing progress from the great cities of the East across the Western landscape in the 19th century. And in her hand is the telegraph line. In her hand uh, is the book of knowledge. She's bringing with her settlers. You see this people breaking up the land with plows. Here comes the railroad. There's the telegraph line some more settlers, the miners, the whole shebang, and she's driving out wildness. She's driving out the wolves, the Indians, and the buffalo. Out with the bad, wild stuff, and in with the new progress stuff, okay? Now, if you took this picture, and you made her quite a bit uh, more rotund, 
and gave her a crabby expression. That, of course, is Queen Victoria. And so she did that in Canada, and she did it in Kenya, and she did it in South Africa, and she did it in Australia. And this is sort of what we were doing in the world in the 19th century as industrialization and progress spread out. But there was also a countercurrent, and, and the countercurrent was called Romanticism. And the idea of Romanticism was that industrializing and transforming the world is not always good. In fact, nature is beautiful in its own right. And because nature is wonderful, we need to do something to protect her. And these two ideas came into collision at a place called Yellowstone in the United States, where the idea was that progress lay in leaving the landscape alone protecting this wonderful place that became Yellowstone National Park, the world's first national park. Not the first protected area, but the first national park protected in the public interest. This is really important. This is about for all the people. As uh, the founder of Candace Park Service said, the importance of Yellowstone was that it breathed the spirit of democracy. It was for all the people. And so the idea of a park as a place on a landscape with a a square box around it. In fact, it was born in Yellowstone, and then beside it, you can see there was created a timberland reserve, which in this country is now called the National Forest. That's the Shoshone, the oldest one in the US. And that idea quickly spread around the world. The Royal National Park south of Sydney, Australia is number two. Number three is where I come from, Banff National Park in Canada, originally called Rocky Mountains Park. Um, the, the actual law passing it was in 1887. And this is now the world's third oldest national park, and so on. And it spread like wildflower first across the English-speaking world, started to take hold in Europe in 1910-ish, and then by 1940, it was everywhere on planet Earth almost. A remarkable thing. Uh, what a great idea. And it gave rise to this, which is sort of a a way of thinking about reconciling that progress, that advance of humanity across the landscape with this impulse of protecting nature. How do we have our cake and eat it too? And so we came up with this conservation landscape spectrum, basically premised on the green box on the landscape. We'll protect this and we'll have our progress all around it. That's sort of the big idea from about 100 years ago. But there was one thing that that idea left out that was essential. For example, in Yellowstone, there was a bison herd when the park was established and it was almost rendered extinct after the park was established because there were no rangers. These things work when there are rangers. And in fact, when the first there was the US Army, as we heard last night, and then there was the US Park Service came in. Um, and the idea of the park ranger is a fundamental part of the success of parks. This is uh, the Park Service of the U.S. and Canada on the border of Waterton Glacier International Peace Park where there's co cooperation among the ranger services or park services of the two countries. But what we've learned is when you have good parks with good management, good ranger services, you have tremendous conservation outcomes. We hear a lot about failure. I'm going to talk a bit about success first. Nothing works better for nature than a well-protected park. We know that. It is the best thing we've ever come up with as human beings. I'm going to demonstrate that. These are the large parks and wilderness areas of North America. And this next graphic is where large mammals were when Liberty set out, the, uh, that Liberty or Queen Victoria set out in the landscape. And the colors, I'm afraid, are a little muddy, but where the colors are really intense, there were 14 large mammals, so think of big teeth, big horns, big antlers, grizzly bears, wolves, buffalo, bison, the proper name, elk. That's where they were about 150, 200 years ago, and this is where they are today. And where it's zero, it's white, and you can see what happened as we transformed the landscape with farms and so on, we went to zero of those species. Buffalo, New York used to be called Buffalo, New York because it had buffalo, now it's just called buffalo. But there were buffalo in Buffalo, New York. And, but what you can see is look where things still are good. Look where the colors still are hot. And then look at where those big protected areas and parks are. There's a tremendous correlation. Parks work. And it isn't just a North American phenomenon. This is parks and refuges in Africa. 
Now, if we think about elephants, most wonderful things, where are they now in Africa? They are where the parks are. Tremendous correlation. We know there are challenges even within those parks, but those parks are working. Let's look at lions. Where are lions in the world? This is where they used to be in red, and this is where they are now in blue, and remember that map of where the parks are in Africa. And the only lion population left in Asia is the one in the National Park in Gujarat in India. These things work. We should be proud of them. We need more of them. Tigers, same thing. Where there are park reserves, especially in India, where the biggest tiger population is, the correlation between protected areas and tigers is almost one to one. Bhutan, which you'll see highlighted there, is an interesting country where tigers are all over the entire country, a fantastic success. And Bhutan has one of the greatest systems of protected areas in the world with 51% of their country. And perhaps no other species demonstrates the importance of the parks more than the gorilla, the mountain gorilla. No parks, no mountain gorillas, full stop. This is tremendous. And there are people, probably in this room, but certainly people in um, countries that surround the volcanoes national parks, who literally put their life on the line every day to keep these animals alive. And I understand two weeks ago, someone was killed protecting these animals from poachers. This is tremendous public service. So I'd like to say this to all of you. Thank you. You are doing the work that matters. And when I hear that park rangers are oppressive to local people, I think, my God, are we screwed up. Park rangers are doing the work of keeping nature alive. And that is the most important work we have in this century. So this is reality for nature conservation. Parks and wilderness areas are the foundations of nature conservation. This is the, one of the books that's out in the hallway that I can sign if you want a copy of it. This lays out the experience of parks all over the world, how they work, and explains sort of the broader theory, some of which I'm going to launch into for a second. So what do we know about nature conservation since we developed that green box theory 100 years ago? Well, we know it works really well, and we also know it's not sufficient. It's hugely important, but it's not enough. So conservation biology, which emerged as a field about 30 years ago, whose goal was to be more like doctors and less like observers. So biologists saying, what would it take to prevent animals from going extinct? What would it take to have nature flourish instead of let's publish papers while we say things go extinct? It's kind of a shift in emphasis to be more like doctors. They developed these four goals, which are to, to represent all ecosystem types, maintain natural populations of species, support ecological processes, and have resilience. And I'm going to walk through those goals and how we can move forward with them in the 21st century, because this is where we need to go as a community of people that loves nature. And anybody who doesn't love nature, you're not going to like my talk. Um, I'm going to share examples of these things being applied from the Yellowstone to Yukon region, which is where I'm from. So the first thing you want to do is you want to represent all ecosystem types. This is perhaps the most famous and best known goal. This is the origin of the 12% goal that came out of the Brundtland Report. Some of you might remember that. There was a statement, 4% of the world, 3 or 4% is protected. We need to at least triple the representative examples of it. And that's the idea that you take each natural region of the world and you protect a piece of it and ideally adjacent to other pieces. So in this image from Banff, there are three ecoregions that you would want to represent. There's the montane ecoregion in the valley bottom, the subalpine ecoregion here, and the alpine ecoregion there. Those are three ecoregions that you'd want to protect. So you want each type of those things protected all over the world. But that doesn't deal with this question, which is what lives in it, populations of native species. It just deals with the structure. So you need this too. Where, how do you maintain the populations of all native species? And uh, people developed uh, those four goals partly to address this. And digging into this particular goal of native species, this is an example of the amount of area needed to achieve that. 
about half of the ecoregion in the Canadian Rockies defined as from Missoula, Montana up to the top of Jasper Park. And then you look at that and you say, well, how do you do that? You couldn't possibly study every individual species and map it. So one of the techniques developed was to think about something called an umbrella species. So what species could you work on that would cover a whole bunch of others? Turns out in our region, a grizzly bear will cover about 85% of all the other species. If you can keep a grizzly bear alive, you can keep 85% of the rest alive. It doesn't work for, necessarily work for amphibians, let's say, but it sure does work for a lot of species. Uh, here's that map now, just for grizzly bears. So remember that map of the 14 layers? Well, this is just the grizzly bear layer. And what you can see in it is the bears were down in Mexico, they were across the Great Plains, they were in California, and that's why it's on the California state flag. That's the first color there. The second color, red, is where they are now. So you can see where they've retreated in the landscape just to those red areas. And perhaps the most important thing is these coffee-colored shapes here, these coffee beans. Each one of those is an island of bears that went extinct since 1922. If you divorce them from the landscape context, they disappear. Islands of nature will lose their integrity through time unless they're awfully big islands the size of Australia. That's a big enough island to work. So how do we find out about how bears work? Well, this is a, a friend of mine, Mike Proctor, who's just darted a bear. You see the little red dart on his shoulder with his gun? And this bear is waiting to fall asleep, and while he's doing it, he's destroying the tree. <laughs> And then you go up and you put this collar on the bear and you take great care, you put it on life support, it's got uh, oxygen up the nose and everything, it's an incredibly intimate thing. I'll tell you a fun thing. Mike, while we were at there doing this, Mary Eva and I, he said, smell the bear. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Everybody knows bear stinks. He says, no, no, bears smell good. So he says, stick your nose in. So we part the hair, stick your nose, beep, beep. <laughs> My God, it smells like a subalpine uh, Engelmann spruce forest. It's a fantastic smell. So bears smell good, remember that. If you remember nothing else about my talk, bears smell good. And this is where bears live in the landscape. So this is the Yellowstone Yukon region. There's about 600 in the Yellowstone Island. Very serious problem for conservation. If Yellowstone remains an island, think about those coffee beans disappearing. This is Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, the Bob Marshall Wilderness, about a thousand bears. And then these fracture lines in yellow are where all the populations are starting to break up. So we don't want that to happen. We want them to stay woven together, not to turn into little islands. This is a more fine-grained detail of the same thing. And you can see it's actually not one peninsula, but there are starting to be fingers where it breaks up. And you can even see, for example, in the Cabinet Yak area, that's actually already broken up right through there. So we need to stitch that back together, and the things that are always breaking up the landscape in our part of the world are roads, towns, rail lines, and they all tend to concentrate on gravel bed rivers, which are the most important feature in the whole landscape for nature. So it's a really interesting conundrum, even in the area where the world's first national parks are. So what you're able to do when you do this kind of analysis is get very precise about how you could keep the system connected. These are the linkage areas that would reconnect the Cabinet Yak area, that island that I showed out, and keep those fingers connected. And I'm going to show you sort of how applied you can get and what level of detail to stitch the landscape together. This is Mike Proctor standing at a place like Duck, called Duck Lake. And he discovered this is the one place where grizzly bears are able to cross between the Selkirk Mountains and the Purcell Mountains. And the way he did that was with those collars on the bear. And here's the movements of the bears around Duck Lake. It's fascinating. There's the lake. Here's a purple bear coming down from here, and that bear can't get from here to there. See? It's not getting through, unless it goes up and around through Duck Lake. Same with the yellow bear. It can't get through, it can't get through, unless it goes around, uh, around Duck Lake. So what we've done is we've gone out in partnership with the Nature Conservancy in Canada and actually bought the valley bottom. Easements or purchases, some of this land is in agriculture, but it's still letting bears through, and we've been able to reconnect those two parts of the landscape. It's kind of a fun thing to do. So what that did is it reconnected those two chunks there. And if we go along that road, Highway 3, which threatens to sever the system in southern Canada, which would isolate all of the American population, one of the things you learn is that we're all in this together. A conservation strategy in the United States that stops there kind of misses the point, doesn't it? 
So uh, we have to do this together. And if you look at where the most important linkage of all is, it's right on the Alberta-British Columbia border on Highway 3. This is the funnel that comes out of Glacier Park, Montana, up through the Flathead Valley in British Columbia and connects to Banff. That's the number one most important linkage for large carnivores in North America. That comes from the head of grizzly bear recovery for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, not just from me. And here's the anomaly of how, if we think too small, we make mistakes. This is a protected area in Alberta, Water and Lakes Park in the Newcastle Wilderness. This is Glacier National Park in Montana, USA. And then this is the British Columbia, Alberta border and Montana border. And you see British Columbia has not done anything to protect nature on its side of the line. So we have to do better than this. We have to work cooperatively across jurisdictions. And this is that BC Montana border. This is a goofy boundary for nature. So what we want to do is fill in this missing piece of the Water and Glacier Peace Park and have it connect up to Banff with a wildlife corridor that would look like that. That would be conservation success. That would get us away from islands into connectivity. And we can do this. This is this, uh, I, I believe in this dream and I believe we're going to make it happen. The missing piece of Water and Glacier Peace Park there in the Flathead Valley is the most important single thing we could do to protect biodiversity in North America at this point in time. Um, the other thing we have to think about in those valley bottoms with the roads is how do we get animals across busy roads? And in Banff National Park, we've pioneered these overpasses for wildlife. These things, we have uh, 44 of them. They've been repeated in the Kootenai Salish Reservation in Montana. There's some now in Pinedale, Wyoming. We need to get them systematized on things like the interstate highway, but they really work. There's a grizzly bear crossing over top of one in Banff Park. Over 200,000 individual movements of animals through those 44 over and under structures in Banff Park in the last 25 years. So we can think about this, we can do this. And I know there is an elephant tunnel in Kenya, I know there's some Kenyans in the audience, uh, that was built for the same reason. And there's been an elephant tunnel built in India too. We need to do this all over the world. Think about how things can hang together. And we need to do this. We need to maintain ecological processes. We need to get away from thinking of floods and fires as evil things. Floods and fires are renewal processes. They're part of how the earth evolved. We need to allow them to happen or we will impoverish ourselves. It's part of living with the world, not dominating the world. This is what a healthy river system looks like. That's the center of life in a landscape. And the way a river works in a gravel bed system like you would have in the Himalayas or in the Rockies or in the Andes or in the Carpathians or any big mountain system with gravels and glaciation, we think of this as the river. That's not the river. This is the river from there to there, from the floodplain to the bank to the bank. And the way you can tell is here the slack water of this reservoir, you can actually see how that whole thing is the river. And that channel will just move across the surface from time to time. If you see an oxbow, that's what it is. And there's more ecological variety on an intact gravel bed river system like this in two meters of elevation, old growth spruce forest through the pioneer colony than there is in a thousand feet of mountainside. That's why we need to maintain rivers. And forest fires, as big and scary as they are, are part of life in fire evolved ecosystems. We need them. So this is the big lesson. We need to think big. And we need to think unapologetically big. Anybody in this room against the survival of nature in the 21st century? Anybody in this room know anybody who's against the survival of nature in the 21st century? If you do, they're fools, write them off. Um, I mean, we have to have nature survive. I mean, this is so obvious. This is our home. This is where we live. So when you have a big dream, this is what can happen. We started that Yellowstone to Yukon idea 20 years ago. There's the protected areas and conservation designations when we started on, on one side, and that's where we are today. It's a big advance. It's not enough, but it gives you a sense that great dreams have great outcomes. This is a lot better than this, and it's almost enough. And if we fill in this linkage break here, you can see why that's so important, that area I talked about where the Flathead is and Water and Glacier Peace Park. If we scale up to North America, we can do a lot on this continent, too. There's a lot more we can do. Uh, and then there's this. Uh-oh, I wonder if he's heard about people saying that climate change will pull the rug out from all the protected areas and they won't matter anymore. Well, wrong. They actually matter a ton. This is a really cool study from England. What's happening is even in England, which is a very crowded landscape, 
The species that are adapting and moving to climate change are moving between the protected areas as stepping stones across the landscape. It's a really important study. And everybody who studies nature and climate adaptation will tell you if you protect up latitude, in other words, towards the pole, which other hemisphere you're in, you protect upslope, as in up mountain sides or up hillsides, and you protect around aspect, which means different angles of aspect to the sun, especially in higher latitudes, that's the best chance nature has to adapt. And then you connect those across the landscape, and that's how the world can adapt to climate change. We need to do this, and in fact, this is kind of what Mike was saying, but climate change and nature conservation are the yin and yang of the same problem on planet Earth. In fact, those treaties were negotiated, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the Framework Convention on Climate Change, they were signed the same week. We've just forgotten that. We think they're different things. They are the, the yin and yang. They are parts of the same whole. So how are we doing? Well, we've protected 15% of the world's landscape and about 3% of the ocean. That's a joke, right? Really? That's all we've done? We have to transform our demands for protected areas from accepting scraps to demanding enough. And this is what happens if we don't. This is a map of the crisis ecoregions of the world where all the endangered species are concentrated. This is where we have less than 10% of the landscape in protected areas. And this is where nature is in crisis mode. Now, just for the because of time, I'm going to skip through a couple of things and jump ahead to this. This is what the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change said will happen if we continue going on the course we're on. The resilience of ecosystems will be exceeded in this century by a combination of climate change, land use disturbance, pollution, and so on. This is not what we want. In fact, that's why this image is so popular. Anybody know what this is called? Okay, how come that's so popular? How come everybody knows this artwork? It's because it expresses an anxiety about the state of the world that is deeply felt and hard to, it's hard to put in words. Well, how about we move away from focusing on anxiety towards focusing on a promising future? The Convention on Biological Diversity is a beginning on that. Its goal signed by 180 countries. The United States is not a signatory, but its policy is to follow the convention, is to protect nature, which is a good thing. And there's this Article 8, which is protect nature with protected areas. I'm jumping fast because of time. And then there's a target that was set called the Aichi target, which is by 2020 we'll protect 17% of the land and 10% of the world's oceans. Now I'm going to say something to you. What's that? It's the number of studies that say that's enough. We have set goals that are not designed to be effective. This is not good enough. We need to set goals that will be effective. This is what President Obama and Prime Minister Trudeau said about those goals um, in March, which is, we affirm our two countries' commitments to those goals, and we will substantially exceed them. Glimmer of hope, substantially exceed. That's what we need. How much do we need to exceed? This is a study of policymakers' targets for conservation, which range in the 12 to 17% range, and scientific goals, which are in the 50% range. Okay. We need 50%. This is a new book out by E.O. Wilson who can explain to you why we should protect half the world. And this is why we have a nature needs half movement. La mitad para la naturaleza o la moitié pour la nature. We need to protect at least half the world in an interconnected way if we want life to survive along with us. And we should want that because we won't survive without the rest of life. This is what we should dream for. Bankers don't set targets about going broke slowly, do they? Why on earth do we set targets for nature about letting it go extinct slowly or halting the rate of biodiversity loss? Talk about a loser's target. Halting the rate of biodiversity loss. My God, that's like, did you finish punching yourself yet so it feels better? We need a goal of let's save nature. Let's have more parks. Let's manage them well. Let's dream about a life full of other life. That's a dream that gets the scream off the face. And we can do that on this beautiful planet of ours. It's just a question of how we choose to live here. Serengeti Mara ecosystem, 60-some percent protected. Guess what? There's a million wildebeest still running around it. 
This is the Amazon. Brazil has protected half of the Amazon. It should probably go to 80% because this forest won't survive because it makes its own rain if there's less than 80% forest cover. This forest makes its own rain. Think about that. It's incredible. Bhutan, which I mentioned before, this wonderful Himalayan country, has protected 51% of its country in an interconnected way. This is fantastic. This is the gold standard. Here's to Bhutan leading the way for the world. And we're right here sitting on the edge of a place called Boulder County, Colorado. Do you know how much of Boulder County, Colorado is protected? 65% in a mix of BLM wilderness, um, National Forest Wilderness, National Park, private land conservation, county lands, and city of Boulder lands. 65%, guess what is considered one of the highest quality of life places in the United States to live? The city of Boulder, Colorado. We can do this. These are studies done by the Nature Conservancy using those four goals. This is the range of all the landscapes of the United States that need to be protected. They cluster around half, range from 26 to 75 percent. That's how much. Western Ghats of India study, what do we need to protect there to maintain tigers and everything? 60-some percent. Cape Floristic product, Province, South Africa, 51 percent. The point is, nature needs half. This should be our vision for the world. Protected areas will be the centerpiece of humanity's effort to effectively protect nature in the 21st century. We will protect at least half of the world in an interconnected way. In, from the wilderness and par from downtown to the wilderness and parks will lead the way. And my friends, nature needs rangers. Rangers can lead the charge. Thank you. I'd like to give Harvey a copy of our book on national parks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Meg. Lovely. So, and we have some time for questions. There are the Anthropocene boosters who say the opposite of what you're proposing here. What is your answer to them? Okay. So this question is, there are people called the Anthropocene boosters. And their theory is that actually... The world was made for humans, might as well get used to it, we run the place anyway, and what we should do is stop doing parks and protected areas, shift our goals from nature conservation, from the goal of conserving nature to serving local communities and people in cities. That's the argument that comes from the paper called Conservation in the Anthropocene, which is the one you're referring to. That is a form of lunacy. I, I, I'm couching my words carefully, I don't want to say what I really mean. Um, <laughs> We do not know how to run the world. Everybody who knows how to make the atmosphere, please hold up your hand right now. Anybody know how to make an ocean and run it? How about photosynthesis? Anybody got the recipe for photosynthesis? We simply don't know how to run the world. It's this incredible form of hubris and arrogance to think that we know how to run nature. We don't. What we're doing is overwhelming a system that runs beautifully and that gave rise to our species and that has allowed us to flourish. We need to practice humility. We need to back off. We need to remember we're in a relationship with nature and that it requires reciprocity. And it's now it's our turn to give. Our turn to give, not to take, give. Relationships are based on mutuality. The microphone will come your way, Jim. Jim Barbrack from Colorado State University. To both of you, there has been concern, following with the, the, the last question, that many of the major international environmental organizations, the bingos as they're called, are embracing this new conservation and changing their funding portfolios away from support for rangers, for boots on the ground, for parks and protected areas, in favor of things such as value chains and ecosystem services and things that's like. What, what would you say to the representatives of those major conservation groups that are here today? Give your head a shake is what I'd say. Remember that you're in the business of nature protection 
And what's happened is people tend to follow the money. And it has been out of fashion with big donors to focus on nature in the last 10 years. So now we just reinvent our goals and chase money in new directions. No. Our job is to fight for nature. And anybody who redefines the goals away from nature conservation is no longer involved in nature conservation. You can't change the rules and stay at nature conservation. This is a really serious challenge for us, Jim. You know it. Uh, we can see these organizations changing. Not all of them, thank God. But it's, if we're in the nature conservation business, it's a really simple equation. We should be in the nature conservation business. It's a really simple proposition. Do what we tell people we're doing. Don't call ourselves saving nature when we're not saving nature. It's really simple. We just have to be honest. If we're having trouble succeeding, let's be honest we're having trouble succeeding. But let's not redefine our goals. A friend of mine, a great ecologist, said, it's easy to be successful if you change your benchmarks. Just redefine the problem you're trying to address and then you can declare yourself a success. No, let's focus on what we need to do. The great work of humanity in the 21st century is to figure out how we can live with nature, restore it, and keep it intact where it is. That's the great work for our species in the 21st century. Don't worry about the bingos, worry about that, and we'll be okay. I don't disagree with um, uh, Harvey's um, direction and um, challenge to the world and to all of us. I think. Um, to be fair to the bingos, um, they are trying to increase the relevance of protected areas with decision makers. Um, when I, I can be very open, I, when I was in Japan negotiating the 10% uh, for marine and 17% for terrestrial, I can tell you that it's not the ecologists or the biologists that are around that table. I mean, we have countries like China who would say 5% terrestrial will be enough. So we need um, uh, individuals and organizations like Harvey to continue to push, um, put, put forth the nature agenda. Because guess what? Outside of this room, it, there's a crowd out there who do not think like us. And you know what the bingos are trying to do is trying to draw that um, vocabulary of ecosystem services um, with those decision makers in order for them to get to the same end goal, which is um, better protected areas and conserving nature. So I, I, think, I, I don't think we can move with any single approach. I think we need all these approaches moving forward for nature conservation. We're running into our break, but I will take one more question if there is one. Over here. Peter, microphone please, because the translators won't hear it. Thanks. Um, I guess sometimes um, the elephant in the room is the fact that um, in the next 10 years, the world's population is going to go from 7 billion people to 9 billion. Um, I guess my question is, with um, nature needing half, what's your perspective on the fact now that more than half of the world's populations live in cities? Do you think that's going to actually be positive for um, nature conservation going forward? Urbanization does present an opportunity and it's kind of fascinating. One of the world's largest cities is Bombay or Mumbai and it has 22% of it par in park and it has leopards. It's pretty interesting. Nairobi, Kenya has a wonderful national park beside it. Uh, the city of Cape Town has a wonderful national park beside it. It's really kind of fascinating. There's even talk in the city of London of uh, declaring London a national park and trying to figure out how to re-engineer it to have nature flourish in it. So there's a lot of creative, it's interesting, we had a national summit in Canada on protected areas goals and I gave a similar talk there a month ago. All the people from the big cities were totally there. Yeah, we can do that in our big city like Toronto, which is eight million people, they were quite interested. City of Victoria in British Columbia has a goal of protecting at least half of the greater Victoria capital district as a in alignment with this nature needs half goal. So it's kind of fun. Um, the population thing, and one other thing I want to say, there's a lot of determinism now out there. There's no way we can do this. The human population is going to overwhelm nature. Too bad for us. We better dumb down our goals and pretend we're happy with that. I point to India and the Indian subcontinent. One of the best places in the world to go on a nature holiday is the Indian subcontinent. 
One of the best places to see biodiversity in the world is the Nilgiri Hills in India, which is surrounded by tens of millions of people. They have five national parks clustered together there, uh, called the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. You can see tigers. It's got the largest wild Asian elephant population in the world, 500 tigers, the largest cluster. And it's sandwiched in among these very, very populous places, and it's because Indians value nature. That's why it's there. If we value nature, nature will be with us. It's as simple as that. This is as much a question of human, the geography of the human mind as it is about the state of the world. And we need to get our mind in alignment with valuing and loving nature, and then we'll be okay. We really will. And the fact, and Mike has gave a pragmatic answer, which I honor, but listen, this century, this is a jump ball for the dream of how the 21st century is gonna be. It can go to hell or it can go to a great place. Let's fight for going to a great place. Let's not worry about the problems. Let's worry about the dream. That's how stuff gets done. It is a great question. And um, I think many of us are aware of the, um, the new sustainable development goals that the UN signed, signed off in um, January and countries all agreed to it. Well, to no one's surprise, um, all of the 30 sustainable development goals, protected area is not in any of them. So th that's, that's the elephant in the room that you're referring to. But I think we can make a difference. Where they say we need to uh, conserve ecosystems for the benefits of communities, that's where protected areas need to, we need to move ourselves into that agenda. And I think that's the real key. And yes, um, it continues to be a challenge because um, we're always looking at the short term of how do we feed these um, seven billion? How do we um, try to keep them in their own countries? Like um, migration is a huge, huge issue for protected areas right now in many of the continents. And what are the... Um, tools that we have to try to resolve that issue. So I think we have to. Let's use the decision-making um, processes that we have and continue to push the agenda as uh, uh, Harvey is telling us to do. Totally in, in agreement with that. But again, we need to insert protected areas into some of these uh, decisions or else we'll be sitting on the, on the sidelines. Thank you both very much.